I would go into auditions and they would give me, they would make me sign an NDA and then give me a side and then no script. And they were like, go be brilliant. No information, you know, three quarters of the way into the script, no character breakdown or character breakdowns or something ignorant like black woman 50 to 55. Oh, Miriam McKeeba, Mary J. Blige, Viola Davis, my cleaning lady down the street. Like, who is that person? That's not enough information. It's also not why we became actors. We became actors to become acrobats of the human condition, right? Not just play ourselves or play cardboard cutouts. And the person that often books is the person that goes in to the audition instead of trying to please people and give them what they think they need or they want, that person shows up with a fully realized human being and they offer up their interpretation in a complex, intuitive, organic way that makes them feel like an artist for the day. And you're offering a piece of your craft instead of a mechanical, let me, let me give you what you want because they don't know what they want. Because as Medina mentioned in previous classes, <clears throat> by the time we get a breakdown in a script, the writer wrote one thing, the director wrote another thing, the producer wrote another thing, and then the casting director gets it and throws it all on the page. They have no idea what the whole thing is. They've skimmed the script, like, right? So the art artistry has been taken out of the process. The emotional chords is about how to bring it back into the, the process of auditioning. And what I learned very critically in doing theater is that actors, unless you went to Yale in the 90s, are really not trained to look at the arc of a character. They're really not. The training, I will say, under O. Brewster at Yale was very much actors were trained very much like directors. They're thinking about the larger arc of the play. They're thinking about the journey the character is taken. That's part of their training. Most actors, that's not part of their training. And after you've been in the business for a while, you shouldn't be figuring out the arc of your character in tech. You should know that. You're not just rehearsing scenes. You're putting together a human being that's learning a complex lesson. Okay, so, and then when I started producing film and then being in TV shows and films, I learned, whoa, this is a whole nother. I learned what, a, for one, that this is all about money and I need somebody who can deliver a deep complex character with very little instruction on my end because as a director on the set, I'm not there to help you learn how to be an actor. That's your job to create the complex behavior even if it's not in the rating, right? As a money person and as a person with my career on the line, I'm looking for somebody who can create the behavior on cue. It's rehearsed, it's complex, because there ain't no rehearsing on TV. You've done all that internal work. How do you do that? Especially if the lines are gonna change, the emotional cords. It's what you bring to the process. It's also how you stop going into auditions begging, please pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Pick me, pick me. You are going to an audition. I am a worthy craftsman, and this is what I have to offer. If you can use it, I'd be happy to help you with this project. If you can't, that's fine too, but I'm not going to do shallow work. That's how you stay in the business for decades without getting burned out because you put your creative integrity first. You are an artist, you are shaping and molding the human condition and sharing that skill of creating truthful behavior under imaginary circumstances, okay? The Dreaming Out Loud Emotional Type class came out of my clients asking me stuff when they had gotten to fuck it, All right? So I want you to take a look at the first video on the class page. Uh, Hillary Are you a working actor? Are you a working TV actor? No, on this, the, the class page that I sent to you in chat, the dreamunlock.com. Oh. Shop, dash. Everybody on that page? Yeah. Great. I can't get it. Um, I, I have it in my. On your phone? Yeah, I have it on my phone, but I can't. Okay, I'm going to share my screen with you. And that'll make it 
Simpler. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hillary Ward came to me in a real crisis, actually, and I'm going to have her talk to you a little bit about that. Hello, badasses. My name is Hillary Ward, and I'm here to talk to you about working with April Yvette Thompson. Uh, April and I have known each other for a long time. When I called her, it was after I had been particularly frustrated. Um, I booked a small but supporting role in what was going to be a excellent high caliber film that was made for Prestige Cable Network. Um, and I got to set, everything was going great. I was getting feedback about my dailies from everybody from the wardrobe assistant to the director who, who chased me down and told me what a powerful force I am on screen. So I'm thinking, great, I get to, I wrap up uh, filming, I get to the premiere in my new dress, I love the carpet, I got my diamonds, I had my makeup done. We uh, sit down, the lights go down in the theater and the Paramount lot, and I show up in the first 30 seconds and I'm really excited to see my face. And, uh, and then the movie goes and goes and goes, and all of my scenes <laughs> with this big A-list star that I had shot that I've been getting all this great feedback about, they all got cut. And I knew why. It's because the film wasn't about me. You know, I was playing the wife of someone who was already an important but supporting character. And uh, the director even came up to me after the premiere and said, I know that we did all of this great work, but if I was making a three hour movie, that would be one thing, but I'm making a two hour movie. So I'm so sorry your scenes had to go and I couldn't get them. And so I called April and I was frustrated and I was thinking I'm embarrassed and I'm frustrated. I thought I was going to have this amazing tape. I thought that I was going to be able to hand this to my team and say like, let's go get them. Look, <clears throat> I have this great tape with a household name. So now it shows that I'm ready to, for these roles, right? I'm ready to go to the next level, but that didn't happen. While I was talking to April, she said, well, why don't you write something for yourself? And I did her exercise about um, finding your emotional cords. And I realized that an idea that I had while I wasn't waiting around in my trailer on set was the perfect vehicle for me to not only play one of my cords, but also it was a story that I was really passionate about telling. And so she put me on a writing schedule. This was in June. By September, I was at her home for a retreat. We banged out the script for a short, which we realized probably was more likely the climax of a feature. So she put me on a writing schedule again. A few months later in May, we were doing another writer's retreat where I was able to get the next draft done. And I'm still working through revisions of that. But what's interesting is that through this whole process, um, what I'm starting to learn more and more is that outer experience is an exp is outer experience is an expression of inner reality. Okay, so as my inner reality shifted, my experience in the business began to shift. As I understood that I am not an actor who has to wait around for someone to choose her and then to choose to keep her scenes in the film in order for me to have a career. I'm not that actor. Actually, I can be a person who is a creator. I can be a writer. I can be a producer. I can be a collaborator. I don't just have to be an actor who's waiting around for the phone to ring, who is doing her best at auditions and then giving away all of her power. So. Mm -hmm. The first thing I did was I talked to my agent at the time and I said, hey, so I know we don't have the tape. That's a bummer. I still have this great credit. Half of these people don't even subscribe to HBO. They're not going to know. They're not going to see it. What are we going to do? How are we going to leverage this credit? And also, I need to know what my rate is now. OK, because I'm starting to get these great guest star auditions. I'm starting to get uh, auditions for major recurrings. And so we need to have a number in mind when we go to them. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I threw out some ideas to him of what I thought we should be asking, because I asked. I asked what my friends were getting. His response to me was, well, I always try to get you more money. 
every job. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So not mm. two days later, I booked my first recurring guest star. I got a $50 raise from what I have been earning a day as a co-star. $50. So I fired him. <laughs> now, a lot of people would think that was crazy. I did not have another agent lined up. I hadn't even taken meetings. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I knew if the next job did come in and I had to give him a commission on it, I wasn't, I was going to resent it. I wasn't going to be happy about it. And I felt like I was selling myself short by sticking in a relationship <laughs> that this person doesn't value me. He doesn't see my career going the same place that I see my career going. And that means that we can't collaborate anymore. So I fired him. And I took a bunch of meetings. I called all my friends. I said, who are you going to refer me to? All my friends who had careers that I admired, the careers that I was aspiring to. I said, okay, I need help getting into the door. And so they helped me set up meetings. And I took a bunch of meetings. And in the first six months, I got no agent. <laughs> but I stuck with it. I stuck with it. And in January of the next year, I got an agent. Now, I got an agent in January, the time that everybody says, it's crazy. You can't even get a meeting with an agent. It's silly to try. That's when I got my meeting with my agent, and then I signed with them a week later. Okay? So, first of all, there are no impossibles. There, it, it's Just because it happened to somebody else doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. Okay? You can make your own way. So, I signed with this agency, and... Not a month later, I booked a recurring, a major recurring on a limited series that's coming up. It's going to be, we, we filmed all year, but it's coming up next year. And I thought, great, here we go. Here we go. What's next? And since then, since booking this major recurring, I've booked a top, great, juicy top of show guest on a network show that will also be recurring. Um, again, not buzzy, but it's great money. It's longevity. It means that I don't have to do a day job in between. And I've also been able to work on some really high quality new media projects. Now, what's exciting to me about the new media stuff is that I'm working with people who have produced the highest echelon. So we're talking the producers of mm -hmm. Black Swan. Okay. And no one under 14 watches TV on TV. They're all watching it on YouTube. And for me to be able to collaborate with these people who are working at that level on where very much the future of our industry is, in my opinion, going to be, is, a, is very exciting to me. And I feel like I'm getting in on the ground floor. Now, through all of this, I've continued to write. I've continued to create. And again, it's that idea that that outer experience is reflected by inner reality. So now when my team gets on the phone and they're talking about, oh, well, uh, this is the way we need to position Hillary for these projects. And we need to let this person know that she's in first position for this. I mean, they're talking like I'm already this heavy movie and shake, mover and shaker because they understand that's where it's going. It's inevitable because we've all stepped it up. We've all stepped it up. And, and if that doesn't come from you, then your team doesn't know where to follow, right? or the, the team is not going to reflect that because that has to come from you. And when I'm not shooting, when I'm in between acting jobs, I'm not sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. I'm continuing to work on generating my own work. And so in that spirit, I, April and I were having a conversation about, okay, you've got the script, now you need to figure out what you're gonna do to develop it. How are you gonna raise money? Well, I've never done that. I was like, I don't know how to go to a TV executive and pitch a script that I've written and sell it to them with me attached as a lead. I've never done that before. So what did I do? I reached out to my friends, who our executive producers, who are showrunners, who are co-producers. And I said, hey, how, how do I do this? I've got 30 minutes. I'll take 30 minutes of your time. I'll buy you lunch. I'll buy you coffee. Can you sit down and talk to me about 
what you think I need to do or the people that you think I need to know? Or can I talk through my pitch with you? Can you give me feedback on that? I was able to talk to the showrunner on Stranger Things. I was able to talk to a co-executive producer on Arrow. I was able to talk to a multi-Emmy award-winning writer on Beep. I was able to talk to an Emmy Award writer on A Handmaid's Tale. I was able to talk to the showrunner and creator of the web series Guidance. And that was all because the people that I'm reaching out to they understand that A, I'm not wasting their time, and B, that if I'm asking these questions, I'm not asking them to give me a job. I'm asking them how I become a better collaborator, and they're willing to take that meeting because they know that even though I'm sitting in their office today, they could just as easily be sitting in my office five years from now. And that it's about building those long-term relationships and working, finding the people that are on the same page, finding the people that are serious. And April is the person who was able to make me realize what I have to bring to the table and to put that forward. So I am driving the direction of my career and I'm not getting buffeted about by whatever trend comes up or whatever job happens to be available or whatever scandal or whatever people think that Black girls are in right now because that's not the point. I'm not here for a trend, I'm here for the long haul. So, badasses, this is your leader. <laughs> Go find her, be brave, be bold, and stand up for yourself and stand up for your dreams. She's a fierce bitch. <laughs> what caused that She's to happen? Bitch. What's the what's the trajectory of her learning curve? What were the steps? She had to get to fuck it. The rug had to be snatched out from underneath her. Mm -hmm. All that work, a very high profile film that was also a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. Like with stars, <laughs> like mega stars. Like from the Marvel right. Universe, Tony Award winners, an Oscar nominee. Like it was big. The rug had to be pulled out. What was the next step? What do people usually do when the rug gets pulled out from underneath their feet? They fall apart. Uh huh. And then what did they do? Try to look for some answers. Blame themselves or look for some answers. And the answers have to do what? Mobilize them. Yes. And how do you get mobilized? You start to believe that um, somebody understands what you're going through and legitimizes you and um, validates you and then and believes in you. And the emotional cords exercise is an exercise in which we do really detailed work in which we source out what you're good at emotionally, which is what acting is, right? And the way we figure that out is we look at films and we look for recurring emotional lessons in the films that you are drawn to. And in those recurring emotional lessons are the four major life lessons you will put here and get right in this lifetime. You understand characters who are struggling with those same lessons. You can walk into an audition, do a cold read blind, crippled, broke, or crazy, and book it because you're bringing your particular expertise, which is your understanding of that emotional cord and that particular emotional struggle. It's specific. It's not, oh, the woman who learned to find her voice. No. And we're going to talk about this in a minute about what example emotional cord looks like. The next step is to do an inventory of your life, of your gifts, which is what the emotional cords is, right? And when we do that inventory, I will tell you, building a website, um, putting together a resume and a press kit of myself, or when I have my clients do that, you get to see real live and in person, which is why I ask people to do a website. 
is because you want people to look at your work, right? And analyze it and have respect it, right? If you don't have enough respect for yourself to create a website and do that for yourself, then why should anybody else? Who cares? You don't care. You're asking, when you go into an audition, you're asking for somebody to give you $50,000 after two minutes of work in an audition. That's basically what we're, even a co-star looks like, right? A guest star. You're gonna get paid and then you're gonna get residuals. You want me to give you $50,000 and you can't bother to get a website and tell me who you are? <laughs> I'm telling you as a producer <laughs> that when I was on the producer team for Blue Capris, Porgy and Bass on Broadway, I was like, no, no website. I don't know anything about you. You can't bother to have a website. I'm not gonna invest my career in you because I'm going to Sundance. <laughs> and I need dogs who have websites, who have PR people, who can represent my project, who can get on the red carpet and advocate for my project so all of our careers move forward. People who don't have good self-esteem, don't have packages, don't have press kits, don't have none of that. They don't have a team that they're running, right? They've not done that personal inventory of what they bring to the business. What they're doing is begging for work and hoping somebody likes them. That's not what a collaborator is. And after we did that personal inventory and Hillary learned, whoa, this is what I've done because I've known Hillary for and worked with her on different shows. Once you do that and you get clear about what you have to offer, the whole paradigm changes. You don't work for your agent. You don't work for the casting director. Those people work for you, right? You give them a clear template in your press materials, in your presentation that you do to your team about who you are as an artist and articulate for them in language that they can understand so they can advocate and fight for you. Right, that's what casting directors do. They get in there, they get your best performance. They give it to the director. If the director likes you, the director then fights the producers for you, right? Instead of, oh, let's not get a name. Let's go with this person. This is what I have, right? Every director that's ever hired me, especially on camera, have been to my website. They Googled, they're like, wow, it was so easy to find your material. I was like, oh, yeah, I have material, right? So you do this inventory, which is a dreaming out loud emotional chords technique. Find out what you're good at, give it a language. And then you enter the business like Hillary did as a collaborator instead of somebody begging for work. What was your biggest takeaway from her process? To be in charge, to have not only the talent, but the business savvy of it all, to speak like you're in charge, to, to, to when she was meeting with the people, she wasn't meeting with them like, oh, well, maybe they'll like me and they'll put me in their show or look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. So you'll like me. She was coming in like, no, this is business. I know you have the information that I need to move forward. I don't need, I don't need you to, to for anything else but to give me this information. So let me take you out, let me take you for this and you know my network with you has and my friendship with you has built up enough trust where you know that I'm going to take this and I'm going to use it to my advantage and move forward, not to try to use you for anything. Creates a, a different power dynamic. Any other yeah. takeaways? I love that you said to be able to say as a collaborator, I'm in your office today, but you might be in my office in five years. That was so strong to me. So let's talk about how we do the emotional cords, how we find them. I'm gonna give you an overview because it's a long process. Uh, Tony, Kim, Justine, and Medina have all done the emotional cords technique class. Um, and they've gone through this 12 week process. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that 12 week process looks like. So 
in the next video, which Medina so graciously allowed me to share. <laughs> I love you, Medina. Um, she's gonna talk through one of her chords. Now, Medina, before I share this, can you tell me the Bulletproof Diva chord? What were the films that got you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, oh. Films that got us to There was a bit of blue jasmine in there. A, a bit. The, mm -hmm. um, actually, we came up with that one in conversation. It wasn't from like my homework films. But they're all that, in your homework films. Yeah. Right? So that was the process. We go through these films and we talk about scenes and which characters we identify with and how they're changed by the end of the scene. And then we begin to see recurring psychological profiles, right? Mm -hmm. After you've done that work, but this conversation can't happen until that work's been done. Oh yeah, yeah, because we were we were talking about the the actor in her own life, mm -hmm. um, which came from persuasion. The woman who needs to wear a mask to live out her true desires, which came from Amelie, um, and then yeah, talking about those. The, yeah, we had like the surface of those and then talking through them, we uh, we came up with the Bulletproof Diva, yeah. So let's take a look at the Bulletproof Diva Court. After all that work was done, then I interview Medina and have her flesh out what this court means. Okay, okay. recording stopped. What is Bulletproof Diva again? Oh, I have a plan. Anything that will set me back. Anything in progress. Anything that's unpleasant or uncomfortable or anything that deviates from the plan I had in place. Like if I had a plan, like let's say with Henry, that we were going to get married and that plan fails, what I do is make a new plan for how to get over whatever went wrong with the plan before. <laughs> and that is how you get through life. And what is your mission? My mission is to live happily ever after. To get all of the things I want. Um, to marry a man who's six foot two, plays the trumpet, makes at least $300,000 a year. We're going to live in Darien, Connecticut because it's close enough to the city that we can still come in um, to see Alvin Ailey and go to the theater. <laughs> he can commute, but it's less, it's an hour each way. Um, we're far enough from my parents that they can't just show up, but close enough that we can spend holidays with them. And I deserve all of those things. And I do my part to work towards them. And sometimes the universe hands me challenges and I just continue on my path and make a plan towards my goals. And all of this is done while doing what? Avoiding? I'm kind of impenetrable to like emotions and like heartbreak and things like that. Like I have a lot of friends who just like meet a guy and date him for two months and fall apart. And I don't really understand that. That's not how I function. Um, I don't know. I'm just a thinker. I'm just a planner. I'm, I'm a problem solver and that's just my nature. Maybe it's because I'm a Capricorn. And in this scene, your goal is to proselytize. Well, I'm here. I've made a decision 
Some people think, you know, it's controversial. Um, you know, some people think it's blasphemous, but to me, it's, it's logical. There are advances being made in science all the time. I have a terminal illness and it is not my destiny to die young. Um, so while this may seem radical to some people, it's perfect for me. I don't have a significant other at the moment. So I'm not leaving anyone behind in that way. And it just makes sense. I'm in my prime. I'm still fertile for me to be frozen. And then once I wake up and there's a cure for my disease, I can get back on the plan that my life was supposed to look like. Right now, I've been handed um, an obstacle, but I've also been handed a solution. Um, and I'm going to take it now. Um, I made peace with leaving behind my plants. I gave them to a friend who has a green thumb, so they're going to be fine. Um, I haven't really made peace yet with um, the fact that Mr. Snickers cannot also be frozen with me, um, even though I offered to pay double for it. Um, but I've put that in the place it needs to go so that I could arrive here today on time. Um, and now I'm in the waiting room, waiting for the next step in the process. Great, let's start the scene. What stuck with you? In um, She's batshit, <laughs> sorry. Do not judge her, please, thank you. What else? Are you asking me or everybody? Everybody. The resilience of the character that this may happen and I'm not gonna fall apart. I'm just gonna move through it and move on. What a else? solution for everything mm -hmm. before it even happens. <laughs> What did you notice in this process when you thought of an emotional cord when you came to this class? You thought it was one thing. And then you looked at this and you learned that it was, when I'm talking about emotional cords, it's what? Well, like, if I could use the word constellation of emotions. Mm -hmm with one major, um, something that stands out more than the others. Is that? Does this sound like any breakdown you've read in the last couple of years? No, breakdowns don't give you specifics, a life that has been lived details where is she gonna live how tall he, i mean when she said six foot two a trumpet player he makes at least three hundred thousand dollars a year in darien connecticut i was like she knows who the fuck she is right mm -hmm. it fuels the audition because you have created a very complex character who's clearly gone to seven sisters ivy league school she has her mrs degree she did corporate america she's choosing not to and her, her needs will be met by her investments. And she's going to get, without fail, what she wants. And she goes into this scene proselytizing that sort of lifestyle. It's a very specific. That's why when people tell me, oh, I'm just the Black girl who's never had a home. I was like, that, what is that? That's not a court. <laughs> it's not a court. This is a court. And this is how it impacts the scene. Could you do the lines leading into it? Uh, She's in it. Think you're not being around for 40 years and also fuck up her whole childhood. Honestly, it's a great point. You leaving anyone behind? No one, really. He's obviously just going through a break. What? 
it's oozing off of you. Your skin is drooping in the way it only droops after a breakup. It's that obvious. Women can hide that shit. Compartmentalize. I've got 25 different emotions in 25 different compartments as I speak to you this very minute. Hiding stuff is bad. Hiding stuff lets you function. I was able to brush my teeth today because I put my feelings about how much I'm going to miss my dog into its own little compartment in the back middle part of my mind. And I will access that compartment when I'm ready to deal with it. Did you tell her you're leaving? I didn't even tell her I'm dying. You should tell her. It's the right thing to do. I always do the right thing. I'm tired of it. I wasn't your girlfriend, and I'm thinking about breaking up with you. Anyway, trust me, she's thinking about you. Got it. I'm thinking about my ex from 12 years ago right now. He's in one compartment, and the ex I'm sure I was supposed to marry is in another. Henry, I should write him a note before I leave. Why don't we think about what we might do when we get back, like see the pyramids? I'm not gonna talk about the pyramids. I could not believe them. What do you have anyway? Describe Christoph's disease. Then, Rich, Lisa? Well, good luck. How do? I was talking about with the girl. Come on, Rich, get in on us. How did playing that chord impact the scene? Um, I kept wondering if she was gonna be like, well, she was if she was gonna break, like if if there was this any vulnerability, but there was, you could see that. That was what kept me in. It was like wondering, when is she going to break? When is there going to be, when is she going to cry? When is she going to, because she keeps compartmentalizing everything. But mm -hmm. it was, it was, a, it was a good tension, I thought. Bulletproof diva. The next scene, we worked with a different chord. Same character, but this chord is fatal love is the only answer. And this chord is Love is an all-consuming whirlwind and she won't settle for anything less. She feels it all, feels it deeply and feels it fast. She gives and gives and gives and deserves even more from you in return. She'll show up to your job naked under a trench coat and devour you in the stairwell. The breaks are off when you're together and she loves it. And when you're apart, her every thought is you. One more time, pick up the cues. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Good to see you. Good to see you. How many compartments are currently in your brain now? <laughs> you remember the compartments. To be honest, they're all spilling out. It's been hard. It's fucking brutal. Any word from the girl? You remember the girl. It's what I associate your droopy face with. Can I get your number? Yeah, sure. Is it all right if I actually call? I might need someone to, I don't know. Totally admit it. Yeah. Hmm. Hey. What'd you notice? Hmm. I noticed the even the physical um, attributes of the of, of her scene was much more. Uh, the first one was much more. She was more up straight, like talking, like waiting to go at this person with a solution or an answer, and this one was much more relaxed, much more um, paying attention, even more listening to the other person, not listening as far as listening to what he was actually saying, the first character was listening to answer. Mm -hmm. This person was actually listening to like respond in a way that she was telling them I'm listening. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Definitely a shift in tone and rhythm. It's just in the whole the whole piece. It almost seemed like a, a different piece altogether. Mm -hmm. 
That's the emotional cords. Can you see how picking up, we hadn't worked on this. I did nine times fast to go through the lines with her before this, but we hadn't worked on this scene. There was no in-depth work done beforehand. We just, the in-depth work happens in the 12 week class in which we're fleshing out the cords. And I can totally give somebody their cords after we do all these freaking exercises, but that's not the point. The point is for you to develop a language to begin talking about how you structure character based on your emotional knowledge of yourself, based on understanding your emotional psychology and then creating a character based on how you articulate that emotional lesson. That being bulletproof makes me feel strong and in control to hide a whole lot of vulnerability. And the how is your specific emotional cord. And it has to be specific or you can't play it. In specificity is where the universality of the human condition lives in the specifics, right? I'm not just a black girl from the pork and bean projects in Miami, Florida, who survived gun culture <laughs> and Jim Crow, right? I am a precocious, organic intellectual child of hippies who survived the ghetto riding a bike with orange flowers on it and peace signs. <laughs> And sitting in my parents' living rooms with Jewish socialists, Cuban revolutionaries, talking about important things and reading Eldridge Cleaver, Soul on Ice, by the time I was eight. That's a specific person. That understanding of how you see the world, you bring that into the picture. It doesn't matter what the character looks like. I don't know if you guys got my email about Gotham. It's on my Instagram as well how I got that role. It said they wanted a Shelly Winters, big Shelly Winters, meaning the fat Shelly Winters, right? In the fifties, she was about 400 pounds. That's what she was on Gotham. I was like, why am I going in through this? And my manager said, because you talked about your emotional cords. You did the emotional cords pitch for your whole team. So do it. <laughs> I was like, all right, lady, pipe down over there. But she was like, "You, I did. I got all of my team into an office and I was like, okay, so listen, this is what we're gonna do. And they were like, oh, okay. And then they started getting me auditions based on my emotional cords, not how I looked. And I went into the audition and I thought, and I'm listening to everybody on the other side. And there are all these big girls who are currently in a musical on Broadway. <laughs> they big, blow, right? <laughs> they are the fat lady that sang, right? And they bring it, you know, they're saloon mamas. They bring that. Um, I'm five foot two. Uh, 140 pounds on a chunky day, I'm a midget. I'm a little tiny person, but I understood ball busting bitch who runs her own BDSM club in this very expensive city that's like New York. I am the sole owner, proprietor, shareholder, and it makes millions of dollars. And I beat white men's asses and they pay me to do it. And I enjoy it a great deal because I enjoy the money. And I enjoy working out 400 years on their asses. And now I employ other people to do that. And then I just went in and did it. And they were like, sold. I didn't change my hair. I didn't change my outfit. I wore the same sundress I was wearing from the commercial audition. It's not about how I looked. It's about what I brought. Right? And that's, that was my way in. Right. I grew up around women who carried pistols and ran boarding houses. <laughs> That's my heritage. I understand those women. Right. I understand that psychology. Of, well, you know, I had the pistol with him when he came in because he ain't pay his rent and he was going to go get the clan. My grandmother did that. I may not be like that, but I was raised by women like that. That's what I brought into the audition. Complete stillness and I don't have 400 pounds, but I am 400 years, all it is. So bring it. And that's what you see. And I was like, oh, maybe that's not it. And then I got to the set. They sold me into a plastic dress, um, <laughs> literally put me on my side and carried me in because I couldn't really walk in the dress, put me in place. I did my pitch. 
And I'm with the star who's kind of off book, but not really. And he's kind of like looking at my breasts that are like so huge. And <laughs> he's like dropping lines. And I was like, just say the line. And the director goes, own his ass, own it. Like only you can. And I did. And I was like, oh. And he's like, that's why you got the job. He's like, I booked the big girls audition tapes all day. And he's like, and then you came in and your tape and you were like, listen, it's what you know in your soul. It's your soul song. That's what you bring into the room. And it don't matter if the writing is bad. Most of it is bad. Get your $50,000, okay? Get that credit that leads to the next credit. Get that credit that brings your quote up another five or $600 per day or per episode, not $50, five or $600 right? When you come in with your deepest soul song, you don't have conversations like, well, maybe you think, no, fuck that. I've been in this game 20 years. I'm not trying for you to pay me some bullshit. Look what I'm bringing. I'm bringing 20 years of me searching out my soul song. Does that make sense? Anybody got any questions? I had just put in the chat, <clears throat> excuse me, the chat of, which is why emotional chords works for writing also. Mm -hmm. And that's where I learned it the most. Creating character. Creating characters, yeah. Yeah, because like in the writer's room, you, those characters have to talk out loud. I mean, in a writer's room on a TV show, that's what writers do. They talk out loud. She's going through this and she's thinking that, but what if she did this? You know, they talk through the character's journey and their emotional journey, their psychological journey, the world in which they live and the realities of it and how they respond to it. If you don't know that, you have nothing to really offer. So in applying this technique to auditions, it's three steps. One, the nine times fast, which is a quick and dirty memorization technique. And I was just doing that with Tony and Medina and you can do it orally, you can do it with your recorder, you can do it by handwriting, but it's a quick and dirty 30 minutes. You can flesh through it and know enough of the lines to be able to work off the page and focus on bringing your emotional cord to the work. The second step is we do a straight read where you just listen and respond from your emotional cords. You trust that you know enough about your soul song, that if you just listen and respond from your deepest truths, the, song, the scene will sing. If we need to do script analysis, we do. Quite frankly, the bullshit that is getting written right now, there ain't enough there to do script analysis. The script analysis is your emotional cord. We only need to know the given circumstances, which we establish. But when we're working on this in class, the first thing we do is memorize the lines by rote with the nine times fast. And then we just do a cold read, listening and responding. The scene will make its own sense. If you're really listening and responding and speaking from your deepest truthful chords. Right. Right. Um, Uh, and then the third step is we flesh through chords that we've already established. So if you've already been in my class, you have a couple of chords already. If you haven't, prior to the class, I will have you pull scenes and we will talk through four or five of those scenes to establish one of your chords. And we will flesh it out in a very similar way that I did with Medina in the video that you saw. And then we will attack the scene again with that chord. Right. Second day of the class, we'll talk about another chord. Right. It won't be fully fleshed out, but we can get enough of it to give the scene another take. Right. And then we'll do that scene again with that chord so that you see the sort of flexibility and malleability um, that the chords give you without having to overthink a very underwritten piece of script. 
right? You are essentially bringing your chords to the work. That's your emotional homework. That is the script. Okay. Shall I talk about this three-day intensive that's coming up? Okay. So the three-day intensive is for people who have, haven't worked for me, worked with me before, and they want to get their feet wet. Uh, or people who have taken the emotional cords class for writers or the emotional cords class for marketing and packaging yourself, but have not applied it to auditioning or creating a character arc, we're going to practice this process. It's going to be May 19th, 20th, and 21st, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Mountain Time. I don't know, what is that in New York? In New York, that's 10 to uh, in, in LA, that's 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. In New York, that's 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Am I missing anything? Mm -hmm. um, for three days, you will be partnered with one of your classmates. After class each day, you guys will rehearse. You will do these steps the nine times fast. You will sort out the monologue and you will rehearse and then bring it back the next day. This is a very intense process. That's why I make it three hours so that you can go away and work with your partner for an hour afterwards. You'll be exhausted, I promise. You won't wanna, somebody asked me, will you do six or seven hours a day? I was like, people will die. Like it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of emotional work, right? Um, plus the technical stuff of memorizing by rote in a really quick and fast and dirty way. It's a skill to it. Um, I think I, that's it. Um, if you pay full, full, full price up front, it's 870. Uh, if you pay in two installments, it's 455 per month, two payments of 455 each. You'll check your inbox. You should have an email with the details on it. Um, I have three spaces to fill. This is my focus in my coaching is small group coaching. So once I get the three people, I'm gonna close registration unless I get enough, you know, interest to open a second section. Sound good? Any questions, thoughts, comments? Come on, Ingrid, you got something to say, Ingrid. I can see it in your face. You saw it on my face? I just okay. unmuted it. <laughs> I saw it on your face. I want to say, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, I have been wanting to connect with you for since Justine introduced me to you. How long ago now? Um, but for some reason, this one resonated with me. Um, finding the emotional cord. I'm not an actor. I'm a writer. And... I want I wanted to plug in and see what what it all is and you've given me so much here that I know that working with you would be um, uplifting to not just my art but my my person and I'm looking forward to engaging with you in the future all of you hopefully uh, in some context so Thank you. Namaste. Awesome. That's very, I will send you an email. Maybe we should have a short chat because my next class is I'm going to do a dreaming out loud for writers and I'm going to do a three day weekend. And that's, mm -hmm. so uh, that class already has three people. I could take one more person. So let's have a chat about that. I'd like that. Thank you. Um, anybody else? What's your biggest takeaway for today? Hmm. To be in Makes charge. Oh. <laughs> That's okay, to be in charge. It makes me think of that old song. 
Um, uh, lady saying we got to use what we got to get what we want. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and our souls have a lot. Mm -hmm. We don't use all that broken, fragile shit that we stored out in therapy has made us some wounded, fabulous warriors. It's why we became storytellers, which is all actors, which is why this works for writing, acting, singers. I get singers on my global retreats who come and do the same thing, tell stories. It's all the same. It's singing your soul song and letting the world know, bitch, I've been through it, bitch. GTI, as my friends, my queen say, I'm going through it, but I'm on the other side of it. And let me sing my song now. That's what I got. Phyllis, how did you find me? I found you because I am a solo show person and I found you on YouTube like a few years ago. And then I, so I don't know, a few months ago, I, I, I stumbled upon you again. Cause you know, I'm, I, well, a lot has happened, but I'm doing my solo show now more. So I looked up like more stuff about solo shows and then you came back to my mind again. And then I sort of looked deeper and I, I discovered um, the emotional chords and I thought it was really cool. And yeah, so a lot of what you're saying totally resonates with me. I think that when I can plug into the specifics of myself, like truly what I've been through and, and have the courage to put that out there. That's when, that's when strength really happens and you get, you get stuff that, and, and, and that's why maybe you've, you've gone through those things so you can help people. And um, I don't know, share, have the courage to share that. I also think that the solution to all our problems is that um, women just get more fierce as my gay uncles that raised me told me they were like um straight women need to get as fierce as gay men see you as mm. okay uh -oh. my uncles would dress me up <laughs> to go to cocktail parties in my not pink not hot pink not fuchsia in my magenta toned taffet dress <laughs> they bought for me and then took me to Saks for a fitting wow and then I would talk about books and sit on the piano wow. they were like we need her to actually be as fabulous as we know she is <laughs> and he and then my uncles would say they're like oh. they're like oh. your mother your grandmother they have so many fears <laughs> that's not your issue <laughs> so laying your fears on her they're like, she'll be with us this summer, which is how I ended up in Key West during Pride at six years old on the shoulders of a drag queen. And my mother was like, is that my child? Because she's, as far as she knew, me and my uncle were just going to get ice cream. And he said, we went for ice cream in Key West. She was like, that's a three hour drive. He was like, it's Pride. Right? And that's what I learned is you may not feel it yet. He's like, you don't have to carry a gun like your grandmother. But you, you've been through the waters. I was six. What waters have I been through? <laughs> it was like, you're going to go through some waters because we black. We're going to go to private school in this town, all right? So you're going to go through some waters and we're going to make you fearless and fabulous now. And I understood that. There's nothing like a gay, a fabulous gay man from the 70s raising a child. Good God, a daughter. Wow. There's a couple of queer couples that live in um, Manhattan Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of them. It's like, I went to a, a party. My girlfriend lives there. I went to a birthday party. This little black girl came in in a coordinated, hand-painted denim outfit denim jacket, denim pants, denim backpack. They'd had an artist hand paint a design of her favorite flowers on it. It was um, non-realist, it was cubist. <laughs> Cause she saw something in the MoMA and she wanted this. Her hair was double strand twisted and twisted been pulled out. And she talked to me about 
how she went and got her whole, her whole natural products made at Comet Kinks because her white daddy took her to Comet Kinks. I was like, Comet Kinks at that time was in Soho, which is like $500 setting. I was like, you took a chill, a six year old child to Comet Kinks. They were like, <laughs> she has to know of what she's made. And I was like, they were like, because she will choose men based on how her fathers treated her. I was like, yeah, right there. He was like, look at you. I was like, I am a baby. It makes you unfit for most environments because you were raised by gay black men. When I got to college, people were like, why do you talk like an old gay black man? I was like, because I was raised by them. And nobody believed that. And then they came to see my show at New York Theater Workshop opening night. My family was there and there was a second row full of these middle-aged gay black men. Came in from Detroit and Chicago. People were like, who are these people? I was like, these are my uncle's friends and they raised me. <laughs> and they were like, that's true. Don't back away from that. They taught me a lot about your soul. And they're like, don't you, don't, don't forget where you came from. This women carry. What's interesting about that is that my hairdresser that April introduced me to, Marvin, he's not gay, but he's around women because he does women's hair. And so I go in and I never have an idea of what to do. I just go, okay, whatever. And he'll just watch me for a bit and talk to me. Then he'll like, okay, that's what we got to do. And every time it's something different and it's a different character for me, it's just another side of Justine. Like when my hair is red, I'm totally different. Or I walk, I feel like I walk down the street different. Or I feel like when I get dressed up, I'm different. When it's blonde, I feel different. I just feel like he looks at me and how my character is with him, how I am with him. And he'll just go, hmm, here we go. And I'm like, I, I guess it's kind of the same because he's always around women 24 <laughs> seven. But also is he sage? He knows his emotional cords, right? He's been through the cooker and is drawn to that, just how I ended up. See, my friends were like, you need to go to this guy. I said, I don't do perms and all that bullshit. I put on a wig, I shave my hair. I don't have <laughs> like, no, no. You, Marvin, you need to go see him. And I was like, who is a straight black man who's hyper alpha? How he gonna do that? He ain't gay? What? And then I got there and I understood. His wife is shaved bald. Okay. <laughs> and he was like, and it's perfect. A hairdresser is married to a bald, fierce black woman. And his wife bore for that, which is how he styled my hair the last time. He showed me, he's, I'm going to style you just like the, like her. Y'all have the same type hair. And he showed me, I was like, mm -hmm. he and the woman, is, the one before that too. I mean, drop dead, freaking gorgeous. I was like, yeah. He, he, a, he likes fierce in your face. He has a sensibility about himself. Hmm. And he doesn't share a lot, but if you spend a couple of minutes with him, you do realize.